Good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Uh, you will have to forgive me. My sermon will be in English, but I assure you that is for your benefit because my Romanian is not very good. Um, why don't you go ahead and open your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 2, and since I don't speak Romanian, I'm assuming that Samuel didn't steal everything that I have to say this morning, but we will leave that up to the Lord. Uh, before I speak, just a couple of things. It, it really is an honor to be with you this morning. I've known Samuel for a couple of years now. We get together uh, monthly with a couple other pastors, and we spend time together studying God's word and encouraging one another. And one thing I have come to know over those years is that Samuel loves you all very much. I know that the leadership of this church, the elders here, love you deeply. They care very much about you. Uh, I know from many hours of discussion that they feel a righteous burden for your souls. And so I just want you to understand what a blessing it is for you to be under their leadership. And I, I hope that you Pray for them and that you see that uh, leadership that they offer you as a benefit for your soul. Um, and again, it's an honor to be trusted to preach here today. I'm here with my wife, Leanne, and my four young children who decided to go off to Sunday school. Um, I have a son, Aiden, who's 12, my daughter, Karis, who is 10, and then I have twins, Soren and Briley, who are nine. And typically on a Sunday right now, I would be preaching at my own church. And uh, so it's a joy to be here with you today. We planted the church that I pastor back in 2010. And by God's grace, our church is still here today. And God is still bearing fruit in the lives of people there. That's enough about me. Let's talk about Jesus. If you'll permit me to read 1 John chapter 2 again, verses 24 through 27. It says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Well, I'd like to start this morning with a question for you. And the question would be, when does eternal life begin? When does eternal life begin? Maybe you think that's a simple question. Uh, I know I probably still look kind of like a young man, but I've been in ministry for almost 20 years. And I have found over those 20 years of being a pastor, that many people think that eternal life begins when you die. They think eternal life begins on the day that you leave this life and you step into the next life in heaven. But I don't think that's what John teaches, and I don't think that's what Jesus taught. See, in verses 24 through 25, John tells us here that eternal life begins with what we heard from the beginning. That's what we're supposed to cling to. So I would ask you the follow-up question, do you know what Jesus said in the beginning? Are you aware of what some of the earliest words of Jesus are? In the Gospel of Mark, Mark records for us the very first thing that Jesus says in his Gospel, and it's this. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand, Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, the very first thing that Jesus said was, the kingdom of God is here. Eternal life has come upon you. The kingdom of God is now, and therefore, now is the time to repent and to believe. And so the kingdom of God comes upon us when we believe these words of Jesus and we do what he commanded us to do from the beginning of his ministry, eternal life begins when we repent and we believe because that is the moment which we pass from death to life and we step into the kingdom of God. Like that verse we read from 2 Corinthians, we become a new creation. And so John tells us in verse 24 that we should let what we heard from the beginning abide in us. And when we look at what was spoken in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we're told that 
We must repent and believe to enter the kingdom of God in order that we might begin eternal life, even here and now, in this life. So what about these words, repent and believe, that Jesus says we must do? I'm guessing you're familiar with these words hanging around church. My guess is you've heard them often enough. But I think here too, in my experience being a pastor, many people misunderstand what is meant by repent and believe. Repentance, to begin with, is more than just forgiveness. Maybe you've been through this cycle of forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness and thank God that he is unrelentingly forgiving. But repentance really is more than forgiveness. Repentance is a transformational change of heart that causes you to change entirely. Repentance is like driving northbound on the I-17, and then realizing you're going the wrong direction, and so you exit, and you make a U-turn, and you begin to go south on the I-17. You alter your direction entirely, traveling from one direction and choosing to go in the opposite direction. When it comes to the kingdom of God, to eternal life, to repent, is to utterly forsake a life of sin and self-righteousness and self-centeredness, and instead, fall at the feet of Jesus and declare that you want nothing more than to serve him and his glory. And belief, again, in 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've found that a lot of people think that to believe something means that you just agree in your head that this thing is true. You give a mental assent to it. Many people will say that they believe in Jesus because they think Jesus is a true person. He really existed. They agree with the facts of his life. They've heard these things from the beginning, and so they agree. But when Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel, he does not mean that you must agree to the facts of the matter. No, what Jesus means is that you must build the totality of your life upon his teachings. You must abide in him. Remember the man who built his house upon the rock? Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like this wise man who built his house upon the rock, whose life is firm and secure and unfaltering in spite of the storms that come upon him. I see, my friends, to believe in Jesus is not just to give mental agreement to who he is. It is to truly trust in everything that Jesus said. You must trust that his way of living your life is the best way. In fact, it's the only way. You must trust that doing everything that Jesus commands his followers to do leads to goodness in this life. And it leads truly to blessing and to riches, not material riches, but everlasting spiritual riches. And again, I've found that many people who call themselves Christians today, they claim to believe in Jesus, but sadly, they don't actually trust him. They do not really believe that his way of life is the best way. They don't abide in Jesus. They don't experience eternal, abundant life now. They're waiting for that to come upon them. They don't really trust Jesus when it comes to their money or their career. They don't trust Jesus when he says that you must follow him where he leads to seek to be holy as he himself is holy. They don't trust Jesus when it comes to things like their marriage or parenting, the way that they raise their child. Yes, maybe they go to church and they say that they believe, but They don't actually surrender these things to Christ. They don't trust Jesus, so they get angry about politics, which is easy to do. They don't trust Jesus, so when the world looks chaotic, they feel chaos in their soul. They don't trust Jesus, so they pick fights instead of sow peace. They don't trust Jesus, so they hold grudges instead of forgiving. They don't trust Jesus, and so they live in fear instead of joy. Churches, I think, sadly, are filled with people who say, I believe in Jesus, 
But in truth, they don't actually trust him with their whole lives, with everything, with all of the little parts. They don't trust Jesus to rule their lives and direct their actions. They don't believe that they should actually do everything that Jesus taught. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples, teaching them to do everything that I have commanded you. And John is telling us in these verses that unless Jesus abides in you, unless trust in Jesus defines who you are, then you have no eternal life. Because that is what it means to have eternal life. Eternal life is trusting in Jesus to lead and direct every part of your life. Eternal life is obeying the commands of Jesus. In fact, John has already said this. Maybe you remember this if you'll look back with me at chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Here John writes in verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And Jesus said to his followers in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, but not do what I say? See, I found that just about everybody wants to go to heaven. Just about everybody wants eternal life. But very few people really understand that Jesus is eternal life. Amen. The way of Jesus is what leads to eternal life. Living a life where your actions, your desires, your heart the words that come from your mouth, the things that you think on, all of those things are directed by the commands of Jesus. That is eternal life. Walking in the same way in which he walked is what John tells us. I mean, someone tell me, is there a better way? No, there is no better way because abiding in Christ is eternal life, my friends which means that eternal life begins at the very moment that you repent and you believe, you trust that Jesus is the only way, the best way, and you decide then to go that way. Have you considered this, that you have already entered into eternal life? Your eternal life, if you trust in Christ, has already begun. Now, John feels the need to write these things to us because he tells us in verse 26 that the world is full of deceivers who are trying desperately to tell us that it's not actually necessary to do everything that Jesus commands. These deceivers want us simply to believe and agree to the facts that Jesus was a person and he loves you. And then you can go about living your life however you want. In fact, your life can be just like it was before. All you need to do is now just attach onto it that you believe in Jesus, whatever that means, and then go about living your life the way that it was before. These deceivers, John has told us, are anti-Christs. They are opposed to the way of Jesus. They are against his way. And John has already mentioned to us back in verses 21 through 23 that these deceivers, these anti-Christs, theologically oppose Jesus because they deny his deity. They deny that he is one with God. But more than that, they deny Christ in practice. They deny that the way of Jesus, the way of obedience, the way of righteousness, the way of abiding in Christ, they deny that that is necessary. And in denying that Jesus is the best way, they deceive people and they lead them into error and into ruin. Now, I want to deal with the problem that we encounter in verse 26. Maybe you noticed it. And then we'll explain how God has made provision for us to resist these deceivers so that we might actually walk in eternal life in the way of Jesus. The problem here is this. John says, you have no need that anyone should teach you. Uh-oh. What am I doing this morning? 
I'm standing here before you teaching you. Am I disobeying scripture? Does this verse mean that I should stop? Maybe some of you wish that it did mean that. But truly, uh, is John saying that the church should have no teachers? Is that what he means? Have we been doing it wrong all along? Well, absolutely not. Maybe you know Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says that God has given to the church teachers so that the church might be brought up into maturity, into the full measure of the stature of Christ. God raises up teachers. He gifts them with this teaching ability by the Spirit in order that the church might be edified and blessed through that. But that's not all. Think about this for a second. This is very simple. If John is teaching that the church does not need teachers, then that's nonsensical. That is an inherent contradiction. And we know that the Bible does not have contradictions. To teach somebody that they shouldn't have a teacher is to be guilty of doing what you tell them not to do. And so that can't possibly be what God means in this verse. What John is telling us is that we have direct access to what God has commanded, to the truth of Christ, through what has been written, and through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God's word and God's spirit are our ultimate teachers. And therefore, when somebody stands in front of the church and says that they are teaching on behalf of God, we have the ability to evaluate based on what God has given us in his word and based on the illumination of the spirit that he blesses his children with, and we can discern for ourselves whether it's true or whether it's deceptive. So John gives us two powerful resources for resisting the deception of these antichrists, these deceivers. First, John tells us that he writes these things in verse 26. John refers to the word of God. The scriptures are our first tool that can guard our hearts and minds against deception and false belief. Don't you see? If you want to get through this life without falling to the error of deception, if you want to be capable of discerning the truth from a lie, you need to build your life on the word of God. You need to be committed to what has been written. You must have a regular diet of what God has revealed about himself in his word in order that you might be certain of the truth and confident to stand upon that truth. You need to read and study and treasure what God has revealed about himself so that you can have your powers of discernment tested and trained in order to distinguish what is good from what is evil. To abide in Christ means in part that we would abide in the teaching of his word. And these things have been written to show us how good and how life-giving the way of Jesus is. They've been given to us for our instruction that we might be wise and healthy in our soul, that we might trust God and have our minds sanctified. So that in the midst of this chaos around us of untruth, we might know what is good and right and pleasing to the Lord. I hope you realize that your mind and your heart are always being filled and informed by something. All kinds of messages are trying to persuade you and influence you. Maybe it's the opinions of others, your friends, your coworkers, maybe even your family, or maybe it's the news. Maybe it's the internet or Facebook. Your mind and your heart are always being influenced by something. And if you're not consistently receiving truth from God's word, then you are making yourself vulnerable to lies and to deception, to the belief that the way of Jesus is not really the best way. It's just one of many ways. The lie that there's abundant life found somewhere apart from Christ a ruinous lie, a lie that ultimately leads to destruction like the fool who builds his house on the sand. The second tool that we have to keep us in the truth and remind us about this eternal life that we have been promised and already received 
that eternal life is found in Christ alone, it is the anointing that John speaks of in verse 27. I've already hinted at it, but this anointing, I believe, is the Holy Spirit who guides us in truth, who keeps us from error. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches us truth and opens our eyes to the wisdom of God. But more than that, it also empowers, he empowers us to not just believe with our mind, but believe in action, to live out the commands that God has given us, that we might walk in righteousness in the way Jesus walked. And so the Holy Spirit enlightens us to truth and enlivens us to eternal living. John is only passing on here to us the teaching that he himself received from Jesus. Uh, we could go and look at this in John 14. If you'll permit me to just kind of summarize, let me read a couple of verses for you. Jesus, in teaching his disciples in the upper room discourse in John, says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give to you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells in you and will be with you. These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom my Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. This is the anointing that we have. Jesus calls the Spirit the Helper, the Holy Spirit who teaches us truth, who fills our hearts with love for Christ, who gives us peace, who dwells in us, empowering us to walk in the way of Jesus and obey his commands. This is the anointing which Christ has poured out over his people. You have it. I have it. Your brothers and sisters in my church, Maricopa Springs, have it. This is what gives John such confidence that we can actually abide in Christ, not in our own strength, but in the power given to us in the Spirit. The commandment that we've been given is to abide in Christ. I think that ultimately means to rest in him. And there's your application for today. If I could encourage you, my friends, that you would simply rest in Jesus. That you would trust his commands. That when he says, come and follow me, you would see that that's a good thing. And you would desire to do what he tells you. That you would hold on to him, to the one who loves you and bought you with his blood. And I don't think that this should be a stressful thing for us as Christians. I don't think it should be an overwhelming thing. I don't think it should be a difficult or discouraging thing in spite of how often we might fail to pursue him because Jesus himself clings to us and he has made every provision for us by giving us his spirit. God's part is to keep us in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And our part is just to rest in his keeping power, to choose to hold fast to the truth, to choose to practice godliness, to walk in love, and to daily trust him. These are the commands that are laid upon us when we enter into eternal life and we swear our allegiance to Jesus. If we love him, we will keep his commands. That's not a threat, it's a promise. And in exchange for that commitment to surrender our lives to Christ, Jesus promises us provision through the helper, the spirit who dwells in us. In John 14 then, Jesus teaches us about all that this entails. It is a supernatural power that's present in us. It is unavailable to the rest of the world. They will have no idea what we are talking about because they have unbelief. And since the helper is the supernatural power of God, it strengthens us to live lives of holiness that we could never live on our own apart from him. The helper gives us access to true life through Christ, abundant life, eternal life. 
He ensures that we will have ongoing love for Jesus and ongoing obedience to God. And the helper infuses our minds with the word of God and the truth that it teaches us, helps us understand that this is a good and right way. It enables us to understand that scripture is not just another book, one among many. No, it is uniquely the revelation of the one true God. And this anointing of the spirit also fills us with peace and produces in us the same kind of life and action and motivation of Christ himself. Brothers and sisters, I hope you know what I'm talking about. I hope you've experienced what I'm referring to. Scripture teaches these things to us, but that's not the same as experiencing it for yourself. Do you know the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I'm referring to? See, the disciples listening to Jesus in John chapter 14, they were probably nodding their head, yes, but they had no idea what Jesus was talking about, which is why in the moment of temptation, they all fled and abandoned him. And the world knows nothing about this gift because the world has never tasted it or experienced it. They reject the wisdom of Jesus about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but I hope that you know what I'm talking about. I hope you've experienced it because this is eternal life. The anointing of the Holy Spirit that makes the Christian life rich and vibrant, unique and beautiful and brilliant, full of hope and joy and peace and love. The anointing of the Spirit is the beginning of eternal life. So as I move to to close, let me just offer kind of one illustration about how I think the Holy Spirit is kind of our helper in this life and guides us towards eternal life Uh, in our fancy Toyota minivan that uh, gets our family around. There is this sort of nifty new technology, or at least it's new for us. Maybe you've had it for a while, but um, it's this thing called lane assist. My wife really loves it because she swears that it has kept our family from wrecking many times. But when you're driving down the road, what the lane assist does is if I begin to drift out of the lane, it beeps obnoxiously and actually grabs the wheel and steers me back into the center of the lane. And again, my wife loves this because she says that I don't pay enough attention as I drive to where the lanes are. I like to just exercise my Christian freedom when it comes to driving. But the lane assist assist auto-corrects the car as you drive. And I think this is something like what John has in mind when it comes to the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The Holy Spirit will not permit God's beloved children to drift too far out of the lanes of truth and into danger. The Holy Spirit will not allow those who are truly filled with his anointing, truly filled with the life and abundance of Christ to drift into those gutters of ruin that come from error and deception. John is confident regarding his brothers and sisters in the faith that in the face of false and deceptive teaching that the promise of the anointing of the Holy Spirit will guide us in truth and keep us from error. That as we make every effort to speed towards Christ, the Spirit will ensure that our trajectory is true. And so we must make every effort to drive at full speed towards Jesus, obeying everything that he has commanded, and we must in that rest and trust that the Spirit will guide us in that direction. I'm reminded of Psalm 121, I know I said I was closing, but will you turn with me there and read this? Because I think this is what John has in mind. In Psalm 121, the psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. What a beautiful promise. So look, in summary here, I could say that John is teaching that it's God's part to keep us and that he will do. And our part is to keep our eyes on Christ. God has made every necessary provision for us to do that. We must only keep running with our eyes fixed on Jesus. So let's just celebrate the fact and rejoice in the truth of this reality for just a moment. God is such a generous giver of good gifts. Truly, honestly, what more could he give you He's given you the blood of his son. He's given you the promise of eternal life. He's given you the power of the spirit inside of you. He's given you this family of believers that you belong to. The spirit infuses us with the life of God. It guides us in truth. It sustains us and enlivens us. It gives us hope and joy. It encourages us and makes us wise. It safeguards us and teaches us. It preserves us and holds us. It bears great fruit of godliness and holiness in our lives. It humbles us and brings us face to face with God, the creator and the lover of our souls and Christ, the redeemer. And friends, here is a moment for us to just pause. Whatever you might be going through right now, in this season of your life, simply acknowledge, humbly acknowledge that God has been so graciously good to you. If nothing else, he's given you the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom to know the truth, and that alone is a good and perfect gift worth praising him for. He will keep you as you abide in him. Would you close with me in prayer as your worship team comes back up? God, you have been so good to us. And I ask that through your indwelling Holy Spirit that you would fill our hearts with gratitude and praise. God, teach us to rest. Teach us to know that you will keep us. Even as we labor to obey your commands and pursue you, I pray that we would trust and rest in you. In Christ's name, amen.